Okay, so we've uh, been through this crisis, and uh, there are all sorts of uh, explanatory formats out there, and it's interesting to look at the different genres. One genre is that it's all about human frailty. I mean, Alan Greenspan took refuge in the fact it's human nature, he said, and you can't do anything about that. But there's a whole world of explanations that kind of say it's uh, the predatory instincts, it's the instincts for mastery, it's the delusions of investors and the greed and, and all the rest of it. So there's a whole range of discussion of that. And, of course, the more we learn about the daily practices on Wall Street, we kind of uh, figure there's a great deal of truth in all of that. The second genre is that there's institutional failures. The you know, regulators were asleep at the switch. The shadow banking system innovated outside of their purview, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore the institutions have to be reconfigured and it has to be a global effort by the G20, something of that kind. So we look at the institutional level and say that has failed and that has to be reconfigured. The third genre is to say everybody was obsessed with a false theory. They read too much Hayek and believed in the efficiency of markets and it's time we actually got back to something like uh, Keynes or we took seriously uh, Hyman Minsky's theory about the inherent instability of financial activities. The next uh, genre is that this is, it has cultural origins. Now, we don't hear that much in the United States, but if you were in Germany and France, uh, many people there would kind of say, this is an Anglo-Saxon disease and, and uh, it's nothing to do with us. Uh, and uh, I happened to be in Brazil when it was going on, and Lula was kind of saying, well, first off he was saying, oh, thank God the United States has been disciplined by the equivalent of the IMF. We've been through it eight times in the last 25 years, and now it's their turn. Fantastic, said Lula, and all the Latin Americans I knew, until it hit them, which it does. And then they kind of changed their tune a little bit. So there was a kind of a, a, a way of which it got, became cultural. And you can see that, by the way, in which the, 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 this whole Greek thing is being handled. The way the German press is saying, well, it's the Greek character, it's defects in the Greek character. And, and there's a lot of rather nasty stuff going on around that. But actually there are some cultural features which have led into it. For instance, the U.S. fascination with home ownership which is supposedly a deep cultural value. So 67, 68% of U.S. households are homeowners. It's only 22% in Switzerland. Of course, it's a cultural value in the United States that's been supported by the mortgage interest tax deduction, which is a huge subsidy. Uh, it's been promoted since the 1930s. Very explicitly in the 1930s, it was built up because the theory was that debt-encumbered homeowners don't go on strike. And then there's a kind of notion that there's a failure of policy and that policy has actually intervened. And there's a funny kind of alliance emerging between the Glenn Beck wing of uh, Fox News and the World Bank, both of whom say the problem is too much regulation of the wrong sort. So there are all of these, all of these ways, and all of them have a certain truth. And skilled writers will take one or other of those perspectives and build a story and, and actually write a very plausible kind of story about this. And I thought to myself, well, what kind of plausible story can I write, which is none of the above, uh, which is one of the things I always think to myself. And it's not hard to do, particularly if you're coming from a Marxist perspective, because, you know, there aren't many people who try to do this analysis from a Marxist perspective. And I was really, really clued into this why, by this uh, uh, thing that happened at the London School of Economics uh, about a year and a half ago when Her Majesty the Queen asked the economists, how come you guys didn't see this thing coming? I mean, she didn't say it exactly that way, but, you know, it's just the sentiment. <laughs> And, and they got very upset, and then she actually called the bank of, governor of the Bank of England and said, how come you didn't see it coming? And, and, and then the British Academy put forward this, got all together, all of these economists, and they came up with this fabulous letter to Her Majesty. And it was, an, 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 it, was, it was actually astonishing. It said, well, you know, many dedicated people, intelligent, smart, spent their lives working on aspects of this thing very, very seriously, but the one thing we missed was systemic risk. And you say, What? <laughs> And then it went on to talk about a politics of denial and all the rest of it. So I thought, well, you know, systemic risk, you know, I can translate it into the Marxian thing. You're talking about the internal contradictions of capital accumulation. And maybe I should write a thing about the internal contradictions of capital accumulation and try to figure out the role of crises in the whole history of capitalism and what's specific and special about the crisis this time around. And there were two ways in which I thought I would do that. One was to sort of look at what's happened since 1970s to now. And the thesis there is that in many ways the form of this current crisis is dictated very much by the way we came out of the last one. 
that the problem back in the 1970s was excessive power of labor in relationship to capital, that therefore the way out of the crisis last time was to discipline labor. And we know how that was done. It was done by offshoring. It was done by, you know, Thatcher and Reagan, and it was done by neoliberal doctrine. It was done all kinds of different ways. But by 1985 or 86, the labor question had essentially been solved for capital. It had access to all of the world's labor supplies. Nobody in this particular instance has cited greedy unions as the root of the crisis. Nobody in this instance is saying it has anything to do with, with excessive power of labor. If anything, it's the excessive power of capital, and in particular the excessive power of finance capital, which is the root of the problem. Now, how did that happen? Well. We've been, since the 1970s, in a phase of what we call wage repression, that wages have been remained stagnant. The share of wages in national income right throughout the OECD countries has, has steadily fallen. It's even steadily fallen in China, of all places. So that there are less and less being paid out in wages. Well, wages turn out to be also the money which buys goods. So if you diminish wages, then you've got a problem with where's your demand going to come from. And the answer was, well, get out your credit cards. We'll give everybody credit cards. So we'll overcome, if you like, the problem of effective demand by actually pumping up the credit economy. And American households, British households, have all roughly tripled their debt over the last 20, 30 years. And a vast amount of that debt, of course, has been in, in, within uh, the housing market. And, and out of this comes a theory, which is very, very important, that, that capitalism never solves its crisis problems. It moves them around geographically. And what we're seeing right now is a geographical movement of that. Everybody says, well, okay, everything's beginning to recover in the United States, and then Greece goes bang, and everybody says, what about the pigs, you know? And it's interesting. You had a finance crisis which was in, in, the, in the financial system. You've sort of half solved that, but at the expense, expense of a sovereign debt crisis. Actually, if you look at the accumulation process of capital, you see a number of limits and a number of barriers. And there's a wonderful language that Marx uses in the Grundrisse, where he talks about the way in which capital cannot abide a limit. It has to turn it into a barrier which it then circumvents or transcends. And then when you look at the accumulation process, you look at where the barriers and, and, and limits might lie. And the simple way to look at it is to say, look, a typical, a typical circulation process of accumulation goes like this. You start with some money, you go into the market and you buy labor power and means of production, and you put that, them to work with a given technology and organizational form. You create a commodity, which you then sell for the original money plus a profit. Now, you then take part of the profit and you recapitalize it into an expansion for very interesting reasons. Now, there are two things about this. One is there are a number of barrier points in here. How is the money got together in the right place at the right time in the right, in the right volume? And that takes financial ingenuity. So the whole history of capitalism has been about financial innovation. And financial innovation has the effect of also empowering the financiers. And the excessive power of the financiers can sometimes, they, get, they do get greedy, no question about it. And if you look at financial profits in the United States, they were soaring after 1990. They're going up like this. Profits in manufacturing were coming down like this. And you could see the imbalance. In this country, I think the way in which this country has sided with the city of London against British manufacturing since the 1950s onwards has had very serious implications for the economy of this country. You've actually screwed industry in order to keep you know, financiers uh, happy. Any sensible person right now would join an anti-capitalist organization. And, and you have to, because otherwise we're going to have this con the continuation. And notice it's a continuation of all sorts of negative aspects. For instance, the racking up of wealth. You would have thought the crisis would have stopped that. Actually, more billionaires emerged in India last year than ever. They doubled last year. The wealth of the rich, I just read something this morning, in this country has, has, has accelerated. Just two years, just last year, what happened was the main leading hedge fund owners got personal remunerations of $3 billion each in one year. Now, I thought it was obscene and insane a few years ago when they got $250 million. But they're now hauling in $3 billion. Now, that's not a word I, world I want to live in, and if you want to live in it, be my guest. I don't see us debating and discussing this. I don't have the solutions. I think I know what the nature of the problem is. And unless we're prepared to have a very broad-based discussion that gets away from, you know, 
the normal kind of pablum you get in the political campaign and, you know, everything's going to be okay here next year if you vote for me, you know, it's crap. You should, you should, you should know it's crap and, 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 and say it is. And, and we have a duty, it seems to me, those of us who are academics and seriously involved in the world, to actually change our mode of thinking.